back the, the one before the last one don't I want the last three go back four we got to do news which kind of rules too and we'll talk to you a little bit afterwards get to the other questions maybe then we'll play um, so we'll play heroin and then I'll uh, who your ass is out the door I'll use you like like uh, Jeffrey mm -hmm. Lee did for yes, years yes, and then like disguise you <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, Indy 1031 my name's Dickie Barrett uh, Ward Dodson and Terry Graham, uh, members of the gun club. So, uh, listen, first question is, what was uh, Jeffrey Lee Pierce like? There were many years in a row where I just had this recurring dream of, you know, just hitting him in the face with a golf club repeatedly. Uh, Jeffrey, let's see, he was a tortured, evil genius. <laughs> were you using an a or not? <laughs> because I was actually thinking of a wedge. Would be the, the, the oh. instrument that would deliver the, the, the most damage. Sounds uh, like you guys could write a book, right? <laughs> well, it just so happens that uh, I am writing a book. The guy was insane. And I, there's nothing. It happened exactly the way it was supposed to. If you were allowed to slug him once a day in the neck, <laughs> then you could say, oh, "Okay, that was worth right. it." Uh -huh. Like right. a like a kung fu right to the larynx. The thing that's unfortunate is like, yeah, I, I he had a really good band. And you know, he, he let yeah. it slip away from him. Well, the first show I ever did with him, he came out in like a white Colonel Sanders outfit with a little bolo tie. Right. He had a huge Bible under his arm. He slammed the Bible down on the stage and then took this chain and started beating on the Bible. And I thought, well, you know, I like this. This is pretty good. I'm from Texas. <laughs> so I, I can appreciate this. He was the star of the show. And, um, you know, we all just jumped on and off. It was Jeff's musical misery tour. It's frustrating, I think, to us because. Uh, you know, we would have probably ridden it a lot farther with him uh, if he would have just allowed it. Could you appreciate the magic and, 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 the, uh, and the genius part of him as well? Lyrically, you know, he was like on par with uh, the, the greats. I mean, we're would talking you call about him a this good yesterday. singer? No, um, no. He sang okay. in the key of Jeff. <laughs> and, and he had bad time, and he wasn't the sexiest looking Jeff. My kind of front man. He definitely was fearless. and. Uh, he he would uh, he tried to get a reaction out of the audience. We'd walk off stage and look at each other and go, "How much longer can we do this?" In Houston, for instance, we were pelted with beer cans before 
we even started the first song. You put in this work and you think like this is a good deal and then you go out and show everybody what you got and they're like, hey, fuck off, get out of here. And uh, we almost didn't get out of the club alive. You're lame, you know, we're gonna, and we're gonna kill you if you don't get out of here. They were bumping our van with their pickups. Um, uh, two guys um, were doing that after the show. So, you know, it was a close call. You know, I remember ta telling Jeffrey, like, can you, can you not incense the crowd when it starts going south? Um, and it was just, you know, no, fuck you. We're doing it this way. You know, he was a tough guy to be around, but right. 25 years later, here we are. It was like we were never here <laughs> at all. We were all just standing there, and Jeff was just really thought he was fucking Elvis, and that he you know, he was Elvis. Yeah. or whatever. I mean, he really thought he just believed so adamantly. Like, just talk about a relentless self promoter. But think you know? about it. What good is it to you to be in Hollywood if you don't believe your own absolutely bullshit? I would have to give some credit to his his, his family. I mean, they were all. It's the weirdest thing. They're just they they thought he was like Elvis too. They treated him like yes, he was yes, Elvis. they did. Okay. Believe your myth, or... And I don't like fuck. my child to keep in the streets like a hog, a dog. Mine on God. That was our first manager. Uh, yeah. She since... Uh, you know what the president did? And how many sweaters can you take in your apartment? She has a lot of problems with sweaters in her apartment. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Uh, for doing this, you're going to give us a couple of hot dogs, right? I mean, I knew Jeffrey was nuts almost immediately. These super sweet people would let us stay at their places, and he would get thrown out of each place. Like, well, I'll take bets. So he's going to last three days, seven days, ten days, you know. Um, he's just incorrigible, uh, you know, making $700 phone calls to Europe and just all kinds of crazy shit. But, uh, yeah, he just started acting more insane. Jeffrey was, was definitely... Definitely independent, on his own, uh, do-it-yourself uh, kind of person. He had a stubbornness and a willfulness that was, you know, Jeffrey's way. Jeff and I met in drama class, which is the, the magnet for outsiders. Uh, we both felt like nobody understood us but the couple of other friends that we had in drama class. Jeff was a huge Brando fan. So we would go sneak off to Hollywood to the Lee Strasberg Theater Institute because Brando went there and James Dean went there. And we started reading plays. We started, re Jeff loved Pinter, I remember. He's coming from some kind of nerdy kid locked up in his room with a bunch of cool books. You know, this guy read. You could tell he was literate. You know, he looked at maps. He read Conrad. You know, he was an interesting guy. He had aspirations of being this great, literary writer. He would read a lot, and uh, he turned me on to uh, Malcolm Lowry, uh, Under the Volcano, he was really into that. He would give me books, he had, he had, he, over at his place he had um, bags and bags of books, and he was just reading, you know, he would read, he was crazy about William Burroughs, and he was crazy about uh, William Kennedy. He really felt he was onto something that nobody else was talking to by reading this stuff. We didn't get this stuff in school, but I think he felt he had struck a vein, that he was in the milieu of, you know, creativity, whether it was this great jazz, this great, you know, literature. You know, when Jeffrey and I were hanging out, almost always it was either going to clubs to see music or we're going to record stores. You know, we did a lot of going through South Central LA and, and the, the San Fernando Valley, just looking for records. We'd go to the beach. Well, a day at the beach with Jeff is nowhere near the beach. We would hit every thrift store between like Venice and Redondo, and we'd go to these record shops in Manhattan Beach, and we would come back with like a leather jacket, a couple of books, and some really great 45s, and never having seen the beach. We called them record cruises, you know, just go Looking for old blues records or 78s. I'd have to practically scream at him, hey, the sun is setting, can't we at least look at the ocean? 
And, you know, you have to scream at him to really, before he felt like you really meant it. And uh, we'd stop and look at the sunset and then get back in the car so we can hear our records and try our jackets on. He had like a white vinyl trench coat. Maybe it was vinyl, but it was a tre white trench coat, like belted very tightly. A big Deborah Harry badge and a... Um, white cowboy like i think they were even girls 80s you know cow 70s cowboy boots and I thought, this guy is really really nuts he was always wearing like striped french sailor shirts or like polka dotted tab collar shirts he was really mod he was just a you know baby face nerdy guy and he dressed funny he wore saddle shoes he wore makeup you didn't look at him and go like, wow, look at that freak. It was more like, what's going on inside this guy? He had a very peculiar fashion sense. Uh, he, he would always talk about uh, Marilyn Monroe during the seven-year itch period. I think especially with the lipstick and the sort of strange male attempt to look like Marilyn Monroe, kind of an homage and tribute to his fascination with Debbie Harry. He loved Deborah Harry of Blondie. They were like the embodiment of that crazy mod 60s beach culture. I mean, Blondie did songs like Love on the Pier, or I Didn't Have the Nerve to Say No, with all, you know, Farfisa organ and those little 60s hand claps and go-go dresses. When I met him, he was in this, you know, Agent 99, <laughs> you know, Barbara Feldon and Get Smart look. That look is not the kind of look that would make a woman go, hmm, yeah, him. Jeffrey had a really horrible history of, like, falling completely in love with women that didn't give a fuck about him. He was almost the equivalent of, like, your gay best friend. He was like hopelessly in love with a lot of women all the time. I think that Jeffrey really related on many levels, emotionally, psychologically, to women and what they were going through. The bulk of the girls we had lived in our heads. There was a, a huge fantasy life. <laughs> yeah. One of the first things that Jeffrey ever said to me was, what are you? And I thought that was a little odd. And then he said to me, well, I'm half Mexican. And I didn't think he looked half Mexican. I told him I couldn't tell. And he said, we're both half breeds. We actually lived one suburb away from each other. He grew up in El Monte and I grew up in La Puente. So we grew up with, with, you know, with Chicano culture. In non-white cultures, it is a matriarchy. Jeffrey's mother and sister, although I don't personally know them, they seem to be a really strong and positive influence on him. His mother's Latino, you know, and, and it was a real kind of Latino thing, this whole, like, um, uh, attachment to family and what that means to people. Jeffrey did get a lot of support from his mother. I think he was probably able to talk to both his mother and his sister in a way that he couldn't talk to his peers or other teenagers. He was not comfortable around a lot of people, I guess. The idea of being a half-breed and not fitting in with either or really sort of polarized culture of what our haves were seemed to be, at least, you know, from where I stood, a constant theme in Jeffrey's struggle and probably why he was such an intense artist. He had already had this electric guitar he bought, this SG, a Gibson SG that he had for years. Um, he couldn't play real well. His first songs were really poppy and really easy, carefree, like nursery rhyme-like lyrics, you know, sort of 60s-influenced pop songs. He was really, um, you know, another guy in his bedroom with, with a cool guitar. He, he was really interested in crazy, carefree, funny girl pop records, you know, and his first band, The Red Lights, kind of reflected that. I don't know if they ever played, and um, all I've, I've heard is the demo. I have a copy of the demo at home. But yeah, it's, you know, it's pretty good. He encouraged everyone to perform. He and I had this little band for a while. 
we did this rehearsal at his mother's house in the valley. She was living at the valley at the time. So originally it was going to be this blues and reggae hybrid band that never happened. And I think we learned one or two songs and called Pleasant Up and said, oh, you got to hear this, and played it for her over the phone. And that was it. That was the entire thing the band did. Jeffrey was hugely instrumental in Pleasant, eventually becoming a performer. Finally one day he said, you should have a band. And I was like, you know, I really don't want to have one. And he's like, well, too bad because I put one together for you. She kind of had no choice. She had to do it. Jeffrey got us a gig at, at uh, Gazzari's, and we all got so insanely drunk on Jack Daniels. Somehow a fist fight broke out on stage, and everyone, I mean, it was uh, in the band. It was like Jeffrey and the drummer and Johnny, and everyone in the whole band was in the fist fight. And uh, I think Jeffrey barfed on stage, too, at, on the side of the stage. <laughs> I, mean, I thought, you know, he really was maybe aiming below his abilities by, you know, struggling with the guitar. They thought it was like the most punk rock thing they'd ever seen. They didn't realize that, that it was supposed to be a rockabilly band. <laughs> it was supposed to be this nice, wholesome rockabilly band, and it was like the worst train wreck ever. It was really, really terrible. There was an element of uh, humor to it, like an insane kind of humor, only for the people that knew that, you know, how insane it was. Jeffrey was very willful and stubborn, uh, uh, my viewpoint anyways, and that uh, a guy like that, when he puts his mind to something, is going to succeed. He would not be limited by anything. He would do whatever he wanted to do. He really felt that he had struck a vein, and he uh, was unshakable. He was just simply going to uh, stuff his head with knowledge, express that knowledge somehow, and it just didn't make any difference who was behind him, who was with him doing it, or who was in front of him watching him do it. He related in a way uh, prescient, bright, original people do to art and creativity and the imagination and wanting to be creative. And there was no other way. He was going to find it on that path. And honestly, he did not have social graces. He was sitting right next to Chuck from Black Flag. And I, I didn't know Jeffrey, I didn't really know who he was or what he was about, but I definitely knew the one guy, because, you know, in, in a gigantic punk rock band. And Jeff was just sort of having his way. Like, you don't know anything yeah. <laughs> about music. The first time I ever met Jeffrey Lee Pierce was at a party at the Tropicana uh, Hotel on Santa Monica Boulevard. We were both really drunk at this party. And then somehow a, a mock fight broke out between Jeffrey Lee and Fast Freddy. Somehow we got the idea that we were best friends and because of that we should fight. And the next thing you see is Freddy was on the ground at the, on this motel room floor and Jeffrey was on top of him with his knees on his on his collar. I was just in pain. I'm go He's going, get up, come on, we gotta fight, we're best friends, we gotta fight. I go, you fight, find another best friend. I was in pain. He broke Fast Freddy's collarbone. It was my Monday night DJ thing. It was supposed to start that night at the Starwood, because I had a Monday night residency as a DJ there. That was my first night, and I was in the hospital. I couldn't go. I went off to New York City, and I had a place in the village, and Jeff stayed with me in New York for five or six months. And I was shooting some photos for magazines, and a friend, an acquaintance, had uh, some magazines on the newsstands. And I was really trying to encourage Jeff with his writing, and I got Jeff his first writing gigs with this uh, magazine called Record Review Magazine. And Jeff started writing these reviews. He was loving New York, but he wasn't really finding the... He was trying to put together a band. He was looking for, you know, a band. Jeff, I guess, did, didn't have a lot of luck in New York, and took off. I didn't go to Jamaica with Jeff, but he uh, came back with a bunch of stories about it. He was an adventurer and traveler in search of reggae. If you go down there and get too curious, um, they'll cut you up and, and um, you know, fuck you over if you're, uh, you know, one of those nightclubs.
you know, apparently stuck pretty close to the hotel room. Mostly got hustled. Probably the better part of valor to just go ahead and say, you know what, I'm just going to stay in the room and I'll imagine what I was doing uh, at these at these clubs with these uh, Rastafarians. He sent me this postcard, so that would have been 79, I suppose. The postcard reads, finally got home. I went to Jamaica for a very long time. I went to New Orleans for another long time and Memphis. When I came home last July, Slash Magazine asked me to write for them. My articles are in all the recent issues. It's very late now. I'm going to sleep. Ranking Jeffrey Lee. You know, the little fuck. The first way I knew of Jeffrey was he was ranking Jeffrey Lee and he was a writer for Slash and he always used to write the reggae reviews. And which I was very heavily into reggae and I was also before I was a musician, I was actually a journalist. I wrote for magazines and different things, and I bailed on that, but I was still sending stuff out, and I was writing for, like, New York Rocker and things like that, and I would send stuff to Slash, and it would never get... I would never get a response. And finally I found out Jeffrey would be in the office, would find the mail, would be looking... would go through the mail, because he was... Basically, anything that was competition, he was ripping up. So he was ripping up my shit. Slash was a very large format, newspaper-style fanzine in Los Angeles that was um, really nice, a very high-quality publication, and it really, it, a lot of us felt like it, it you know, kind of legitimized uh, the scene in a way. And uh, so wh whoever was associated with that or wrote for it, uh, you know, instantly took on, you know, some kind of glow. It was actually good to know that it wasn't my writing just really sucked and these guys in L.A. hated it, you know, or something, but it was just fucking Jeffrey being like, you know, Jeffrey. <laughs> he was writing for Slash Magazine and, um, and different things, and that's one of the things we kind of bonded on was that we were, you know, interested in writing about music as well as, like, being record collectors, and, and he was doing his Blondie fan club. It was only beneficial to make him the president of their fan club because he was a real fan. I remembered Blondie were staying at the Sunset Marquee Hotel and Jeffrey really wanted to be in there. Jeffrey had found a shopping cart that was in the hall. Uh, Jeffrey was inside the shopping cart and either Pleasant or I was pushing him down the hall when Debbie came out in the hall and I think that was the moment that won Debbie Harry's heart. I think she understood that his heart was in the right place, that he idolized her for all the right reasons, that he loved the music, he loved the image, he understood what Blondie was trying to accomplish. Jeffrey was the president of the Blondie fan club, and Kid Congo was the president, the West Coast president of the Ramones fan club. And I think we got terribly drunk, and we, uh, started talking a lot about writing, or a lot about music, a lot about traveling. He had been traveling, he had been to Jamaica and New York, and I'd been in Europe and London and New York as well. And we were just talking about bands we liked and this and that. And um, eventually, kind of at the end, before, like when we went in, or maybe before the end of the night, it was like, well, you sh we should have a band together. And I was like, well, you know, I don't play any instrument or anything. He was like, well, why don't you just be the singer? And I was like, no, 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 I'm not going to be the singer. And I said, I definitely am not going to be the singer. And so he just said, like, well, you can be the guitar player, I'll be the singer, and we'll, uh, we'll uh, you know, make a band, and I'll teach you. I have an extra guitar hanging around, and I'll teach you how to play. And so I was like, ooh. Okay. Uh, it was it was really interesting because Kid really couldn't play guitar and Jeffrey really couldn't play guitar, um, and Don Snowden was an okay bass player. He was he was heavily into the meters and things like that. So, and I had Brad Dunning. I don't know what he listened to, but they kind of had this weird, swampy, different sound. I think we actually pretty much you know played out right away. I was the booking agent for the Blasters at that time. Um, you know, we were just a local band, and so I'd call all the clubs, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, there was a club called the Hong Kong Cafe in Chinatown, and the Blasters got 
a month of Saturdays, so we could book whoever we wanted to be our opening acts. And then I get a phone call from Jeffrey Lee Pierce saying, yeah, he screwed up, man. Uh, that gig, uh, your Saturday night gig, that's ours. That's our gig. And I was like, no, it isn't. It's just blah, blah, blah. We went back and forth. And then I realized he was trying to scam me into getting a gig. And I kind of respected that. I thought that was kind of funny. And so I gave him the gig. And I can remember someone from the audience saying, maybe if we're quiet, they'll go away. Um, that was the first time I ever saw the gun club. I remember we played some really uh, terrifying music. <laughs> Horribly awful. We did a couple of, of gigs with Snowden and the other guys, he taught them how to play. He taught Kid Conga how to play guitar. He gave me like a Bo Diddley record, a guitar, a slide, and he said like, oh, this is how blues players play in open E tuning. It was really interesting because it was all new to them. And so when Kid Conga was playing slide guitar, he wasn't trying to sound like either Dwayne Allman or Elmar James. It, it's, he, he wouldn't know where to go to, to do that. Actually, Jeffrey made a tape for all of us this tape kind of was the genesis of what was to become the Gun Club, and it was a lot of, um, like, murder ballads and just, like, things really kind of some, not like, normal ballads, like, you know, like Marty Robbins, gunfighter ballads. It was moody, and it was, it was you know, it, here was Jeffrey who, who couldn't sing like Tommy Johnson or Charlie Patton or trying to sing that way and trying to carry off this sort of myth of him being one of those kind of guys. And it kind of, like I said, it worked. But I don't think more than five people ever came to see one of our shows. So um, I think that that just, that kind of lineup eventually dispersed. And, uh, and we decided we wanted to keep on playing. Rob Ritter and I played together in the bags. They wore bags on their heads. Um, it started out as a joke, as a lot of punk bands did. And, and I mean, it's a literal joke. But of course, you know, a joke, you sort of like doing it, and you really don't want to give it up, even after the laughs are gone. So you get kind of serious, and it becomes a band. But the bags ran their course, you know, through punk rock, uh, L.A. But when that was over, Rob and I were kind of, um, you know, he was the bass player, I was the drummer. So we were just sort of kind of a unit looking for something to do. I think Terry and Rob had seen us and had really taken to the uh, attitude of the band and, and um, for whatever reasons. It was sloppy, it was, it was uh, not good, but it, it was very intriguing and um, that was enough. That really changed things really, really a lot, you know, because they could play really well and they were a rhythm section that was ready-made. The Gun Club at this time, we were playing to 15 people a show. There was no record, there was no anything. So one day I just got a call from Ivy of the Cramps asking me to, if you know, do you wanna, you know, would you be interested to be in our band? And I was like, Oh, I don't know, you know, <laughs> I don't know how to play. <laughs> um, of course, I called Jeffrey immediately and was like, what do I do, what do I do? <laughs> yeah, the cramps asked me to play and he's like, are you crazy? You should do it, and I'd do it in a minute. The only question she said was like, well, what are, you, what are you willing to sacrifice? And I was like, well, what, like, you know, going to college or moving or my band or what? And she's like, oh no, I mean like, would you be willing to sacrifice a finger or something? <laughs> I said, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> and so that was that, and Jeffrey, Jeffrey's blessing, off I went. And so we needed a guitar player, uh, and then uh, that's how we found Ward. I was a huge Cramps fan, and uh, I saw Ivy at, a sh at the Whiskey, and I said, uh, you're my favorite band, etc., etc. Can I be in your band? Uh, said, well, you got to write a letter to this lady and send a picture. And so I did that and took a week off of work because I just knew they were going to call me. And, and, of course, that didn't happen. And they picked Kid, and I was a little crestfallen. And maybe later that week I saw Jeff at, uh, at a Billy Zoom concert. And uh, I just went up to him and said, are you still looking for a guitar player? And I didn't say, I want to be in your band. I like your band. 
anything to that, you know, effect. And the next day, I was in the Gun Club. Ward brought um, a lot of interesting things to the band. I embellished some things uh, that that Kid was doing. I was, you know, better guitar player than he was. But the fact that he couldn't play really uh, just—it was, it was just a great mishmash. The open E tuning uh, was uh, an idea that Jeff had to uh, to get Kid in his band. Instead of playing an E chord, you just tune the guitar to an E chord, and then you know he could just shout out numbers to him, like you know, open, you know, three, five, seven. I guess Kid had you know numbers on the side of his guitar, and then Jeff could just show him how to play the the songs. But the um, they couldn't do minor chords. It was it was this like kind of weird caveman punk rock. The whole point to punk rock was that we could reclaim rock and roll. In the middle and late 70s, rock and roll was a corpulent blob of gristle that was that was dead, that was busy, bent over sucking its own cock. And every time it would come, it would lay back down and then bend back over again and start sucking its own cock again. And there was no, there was no room in there for anything else other than its own, its own penis that it, it feeds on, uh, and, and the money and, and the hair and the quaaludes and, and all the stuff, all the disgusting mess that rock and roll had become. And then you had disco come along out of left field, uh, which while rock and roll is sucking its own dick, disco crawls up from behind it and tries to fuck it in the ass at the same time. So you have a you have a you have a mess here. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of that uh, whatever you just said, man. My brain is <laughs> pudding. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about the making of uh, Fire to Love. I don't know. We weren't together, but a few months before we started thinking about putting a record out. Tito Lariva, uh who was in the plug, said, uh, hey, I'll give you some money to make a demo, and then I'm going to put out these EPs that'll be just one side of a 33 and a third LP. This is my, you know, my gimmick. To say it was a tight budget uh, is really not really describing it. We went in at, I don't know what time, really late, and recorded about five or six songs. Basically, you know, you just go in, you turn the machine on, you play your songs, and then you walk out the door as quickly as you can. That he was having trouble getting, like, uh, the label together. And in that interim, Jeffrey took that tape and went over to Slash, where he used to work, and would just play it on a cassette. And I guess through doing that, uh, Bob Biggs heard it and said, what's this? And uh, Chris D., who is the singer in the Flesh Eaters and also worked at Slash, totally championed the band and convinced Bob Biggs to put this, you know, measly little record out on Ruby, which was a subsidiary of Slash. Chris D. came in and, you know, working with Jeff, uh, they created the final product. And uh, so even though half the songs are a little bit, sound a little bit different than the other half, I mean, to me, it's still a, a pretty cohesive whole. Fire of Love was definitely a, a, a seminal record. No record sounded like Fire of Love before. It was certainly had its influences in all of Jeff's blues records. And, uh, you know, the Cramps and X kind of getting the, the wheels in motion that you could combine punk with another genre and it could be really interesting. But um, Fire of Love was, you know, 11 songs that are just perfect. When I first heard Fire of Love, I was seriously blown away because you could clearly, you could hear lyrics and hear intonations that were not at all audible on stage. And you could finally hear what Jeffrey was singing about, and he's, you know, as good a lyricist uh, as was writing from that period since. He adopted this great persona of this refugee Civil War soldier you know, almost like everyone was talking about Vietnam in the late 60s, Jeffrey was talking about Civil War in the early 80s. And so you had Jeffrey Lee Pierce as a 22-year-old kid from the Valley, you know, no nexus to, uh, to anything involved at that time. And he just wrote these great songs about, you know, riding on a black train. You know, this kid didn't ride on a black train. He tied in what we picked up in the theatrical, what he picked up in his writings like Faulkner, 
um, Beckett, and Burroughs, and Pinter, and created this this kind of character, this this alter ego that he could slide into. And then, boom! That record got made, and it came out, and immediately uh, people got it. For us to get the word out, of course, we had to tour like every other band has to. But really, it, again, it was totally do it yourself. I mean, the first Gun Club tour, we went to Rocket Rent a Car. It actually said Rent a Rocket on the side of the van. This beat up van. The shittiest van that has ever been made. There's nothing in it. it and, and so we stuffed ourselves, our equipment, uh, and a few good luck charms, and, um, you know, hit the road. We went out and worked the record. Yeah, we, we played it. the South and the Midwest mm -hmm. and we, in a perfect time of year, uh, February, because uh, the weather is so mild in the United States, uh, in, you know, in the Midwest and the North. The thing that, that just took us completely by surprise was the reaction the record got almost immediately uh, everywhere east of the Mississippi. And then when he went to New York and he got on the cover of New York Rocker, that was a big deal, you know, New York Rocker was uh, you know, in those days was the, the Rolling Stone for the alternative music set. That was a shocker, uh, and not because it was a gun club, just seeing Jeffrey's face so large on the cover of a magazine was kind of shocking. Uh, the New York Times, uh, Robert Palmer was their, their rock critic, I think, at the time, and he wrote a review of Dylan's new record and, and, the, and the Gun Club Fire of Love record. And the New York Times does not do new bands, and he basically said, you know, in, in, with, the old, uh, in with the new, out with the old, that is awfully heady stuff from some band that no one gave two shits about in L.A. Um, so all, sudden instant credibility in New York, in Boston. Our first show we did in Boston, I mean, I, I, it was about the most amazing uh, live experience I've ever had. The, they were just packed into this, to this club. Uh, the energy was just, it, just so thick you could cut it with a knife. It just sort of caught on like in, in you know, hot spots that were later hot spots like Minneapolis and Austin, Texas, uh, college towns. Shortly thereafter, we went to London, and the first show at the venue, which held 1,200 people, was sold out. And, uh, you know, the reviews were great. The French ate it up, and all of Europe, and it's a great record, you know. I mean, we all felt great. If It made you feel great, you know, right. to be that well-liked. But uh, I, I think that maybe that's when it started, where, you know, this, this adoration uh, he, in Jeff's mind, kind of became separated from the band as a whole. It wasn't gun club adoration, mm -hmm. it was adoration for me. Remember the band went on stage and it was packed house, about a thousand people, and got a you know, nice ovation. We started playing some song and then Jeff walked on later and yeah, it was like the Grinch's heart or whatever. You know, I saw his head just go boom, 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 boom. And, and he would never really let on that this kind of thing was going on inside of him. You know, he always tried to play, kind of play everything down. But in fact, yes, this, this, uh, this just boosts his, his uh, ego like, uh, like nothing else. Man, I didn't ask for anything. There were a lot of friends of the bands, and after we would do shows, some of these temporary friends would uh, show up, and, and uh, there always seemed to be um, uh, friends there waiting for Jeffrey and so I, I just felt like I knew Je kind of Jeffrey had a girlfriend problem because I never really saw him with, with a girl. So much of what he talked about in the songs was kind of like the dark side of romance, the dark side of relationships, the dark side, I mean not that it was a kind of um, confessional writing because it was more stories but uh, that's so bizarre that I never even thought of him as like a sexual being, even though he totally was, but he was never hooked up with anybody. Girls would be nice to him because his, his star was rising, but you know, I don't ever remember him hooking up with any girls, uh, except for, uh, what's her name, Tex. She was waitressing at the lingerie. And um, I, I think that's where they met, and uh, he became infatuated with her. Obsessed. Jeffrey Lee and Tex was like a Pygmalion kind of thing, where he was he was molding her in, in, in his uh, image. Jeff, what are you doing here? He had enough of a vision that he could. He basically formed Tex and the Horseheads. Jeffrey formed Tex and the Horseheads as a side project for Texicala Jones, 
and uh, Jeffrey played a few shows and Kathy DeGrand and then he had to uh, leave to go to Europe and uh, enlisted me to play the uh, guitar that was great there's and you know he, he had they did cover songs they were very much in his style and uh, I'm not sure if he told them they were you know that uh, they were his or not I remember I used to DJ at Club Lingerie and and one day I'm playing Slip Away, the um, Clarence Carter record. And I don't think Tex knew it was a cover until maybe uh, a few years later. We, you know, she found out, I think, uh, through Fast Freddy. You know, she comes running up to me and goes, Where did you get this? They're doing my song! <laughs> you know, I go, This is from 1967, Tex. <laughs> you know. It was funny because later on, you know, I mean, I realized Jeffrey had this kind of pension for women that looked exactly like Tex. She had a wild look, you know, hair, clothes, everything, and it was just leathered and laced and sleazy, and it was a cool look, actually, um, and Jeff loved it, and I think he just felt this um, connection with her. I like that song on the record, you know, where the drums go boom, 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 and then he had these saxophones, and the guitar, wow, wow, And I remember they opened for the Gun Club in New York. I mean, he flew her to New York and just force-fed her to the, the Gun Club audience, and he played guitar, and, and I, someone told me that when the Gun Club was playing, like the security guard was banging her, and the, you know. I, Tex also was supposed to be the girlfriend of the guitar player in Parliament Funkadelic. I don't know. We always used to speculate if they were, like, sleeping with each other, you know. But I don't, I, don't, I don't know if they were or not. Tex and Jimmy Joe had sparks there for a few minutes, so that caused friction with Jeffrey, who was a very, very jealous young man. It just had to be torturous to be, you know, the guy who's the star of the band and just cannot seem to get anything going. Shut up. So then, uh, I mean, as the band got, you know, that critical acclaim was there and then, and then fans started to follow him behind it, um, it was from the East Coast. We had offers, uh, you know, from booking agents and, and people in New York. Basically, uh, and of course, you know, Jeff had always had uh, some kind of relationship, I guess, with Blondie, the band, um, on some level. And then when they got their Vanity label, um, um, we were um, one of the bands that they had uh, considered because we, you know, we'd already kind of made it a name for ourselves by that time anyway. And so really the band had, had shifted from L.A. to a New York band. He uh, started hanging out with some other people and, and trying to score drugs. I mean, it's weird. Like, I, I drank more than he did, but I didn't act like a complete idiot. It, it had a different effect on him. You know, it just, he was kind of mad anyway. Um, and it just made him even more, you know, crazed. I remember one time at the Ninth Circle, this bar we used to all go to in, in New York, that was, that was when Jeff was starting to really get a lot into heroin. Jeffrey wanted to be a drug addict and an alcoholic and a, you know, it's a terrible thing to want to, to be, to aspire to be. But uh, I, apparently he got his wish because um, that, that happened for him. All right, this song's about people who are worried about sex. She's being the drugs. So we recorded um, Miami uh, in New York at a very small studio that I, uh, I never liked. Uh, I never ever liked the sound of that record and I don't know anyone who does. Uh, it's too bad. I thought some of Gun Club's really good songs were on that record. Miami uh, was an improvement over Fire of Love for a couple reasons. I think Jeffrey's lyric writing had progressed in that year or so. He, uh, some of those songs were definitely a carryover from the first record. I know Bad Indian and the title track from the first one. Um, there are also a lot of harmonies on that record that Fire of Love never dreamed of. But at that time, the band was really starting to split apart. It was going to Jeff's head. There he is, Chris Stein's next to him. He's producing a record. And uh, I, there, somebody is telling him, you don't need your band. All you need is you. I think we should have stayed with Slash and we should have had somebody different produce the second record. That was a, a, a huge career mistake. I think had he been with less understanding guys, 
he might have been minus a tooth or two after telling you to your face that he doesn't need you he can put anybody in the band and still do the same thing it was a culmination of that first lineup and at that time rob uh, isn't featured on the cover i know because he quit before it came out and that's really when the band ended as soon as rob quit the band i was like well shit i guess if i what what can i get out of this you know can i are we going to europe again i'd like to do that um that's a terrible attitude to have. You know, the writing is on the wall. I mean, he, Rob was really half the reason I was in the band, and the other half was Terry. Ward left, and I'm sure he thought, you know, it sucked that I stayed in the band, and, and uh, because he and Jeff just did, did, they did not get along. So we finished up this U.S. tour, which was just, you know, every day, it's just inches from belting him. And the last week, there were maybe like three or four shows left, and the roadie came in my room and said, you know, Jeffrey's packing his bag. I just heard him make a reservation at the airport for a plane ticket. He's leaving. This is he's a cowardly guy, too, you know. He wasn't going to tell anybody. He was just going to skip out. Um, and I went into his room, and I said, look, motherfucker, you're finishing this tour. Unpack your bags. We're finishing this tour. You're not leaving us high and dry, okay? And uh, we finished the tour, and that was the last I ever talked to him. You know, I got home, and someone said, hey, I saw Gun Club has a new record out, and, and I wasn't on it, so I assumed I wasn't in the band anymore. But, you know, I was, it was, it was a get fired, uh, quit, you know, thing all the way around. He hated me, and I hated him. He and Jeff just did, did they did not get along at all. They could not see eye to eye uh, on anything at that point. That was the end of the Gun Club for me. and I cried a million tears. I introduced the idea of bringing in Patricia as a bass player to the band after Rob left and went to 45 Grave. Inadvertently, uh, Alice Bag's band <laughs> became a, a definite, uh, you know, AAA team for the gun club. <laughs> you know, it's really funny how that worked out. It's strange how, how things work because Again, even for me, I was starting to think, well, you know, there, there's probably going to be another band I'm going to have to be in because um, uh, this one is, I, I just, I don't trust it and, and I don't think it's, it's going to last very long. And so when I finally left the band, obviously, you know, dumping on them uh, in a tour, which I, 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 um, I don't feel bad about, um, didn't then, don't now. From there, Jeffrey was like, okay, I'm going to get the new gun club together. I'd had it with playing in the band I was in for various reasons. And I told the booking agent, who also booked the gun club, that I would no longer intended to play with the Panther Burns after this tour. Um, the booking agent said, I think I might have something for you. Duckworth could play a lot of shit. I mean, he was, he, he was a really, really awesome guitar player. They ended up hiring Deep Pop and me and we were the new additions to the gun club along with Patricia Morrison. Patricia was kind of the odd person out in the band because she was really quiet. She took me to an Irish bar the first night I met her and talked to me about what to expect from Jeffrey, that he was somewhat inconsiderate and volatile. You'd see her in the daytime with their hair down and it was like this, you know, librarian. And then like, you know, two cans of Aquanet later and his I was learning the songs off Miami and I got a call to come and record apparently Tex and the Horsehead session had canceled and I was to come to New York that night and record of course I think we rehearsed that night and rec started recording the next day recording these songs that became the EP Death Party the record was made in the studio it was like it was really written I never I never had worked in a situation where, like, tracks weren't written yet, but on a piece of paper. And when we played uh, House on Highland Avenue, Jeffrey basically didn't have a song. He hummed it to me in the cans and went, da, la, 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 la. Okay, just play four beat, four measures, of, doo, doo, ba, ba, doo, doo, ba. and then, okay, 
after four, do a little roll because we're going to be into a chorus. I think that was kind of uh, a missed opportunity, and too bad we didn't get something a little bit more um, thorough from that lineup because the, uh, the live shows were intense. We played the East Coast for about two or three weeks and then went to Europe where we played about 56 dates in almost as many days. The, the French tour we did was so out of control on, on drugs. Like, I remember the first gig we did, we played eight songs for two hours and 45 minutes. D had a history of using junk and could do it. D could drink heavily. I left on that tour with a broken hand. I had a bunch of broken fingers and went to a doctor the day before we were supposed to leave and the doctor said you have three choices. You can re-break the hand and put it in a cast, put a cast on it just the way it was, or the other thing was just go on the fucking tour and leave it alone and let it heal eventually, which is what I did. Dee's knuckle was way back, oh, I don't know how far back in his hand, from having been in a fight. So needless to say, it hurt like a motherfucker and I needed all the self-medication I could find, which was not something I wasn't probably gonna do anyway, but in this case, I had an excuse. You know, we got off a plane in Paris and the promoter goes, oh, you need something to wake you up? And we're like, yeah, yeah, we we're expecting, you know, white lines and he gives us dope instead. So I remember we had to go up this spiral staircase up to the stage and we're walking up, and the first person that the line goes, Oh, guys, this isn't coke. And we're going to be throwing up over the railing and, you know, hitting probably Patricia, who was the last one who wasn't doing any drugs at the beginning of the tour. But, you know, that, that was the first day of the tour, and that was the mildest part. We got to France, and we get there, and we're supposed to sign records. Well. They're giving us Miami, which is the new gun club record. Of course, since Dee and I aren't on there, and since we've been drinking, we started signing that record and, well, other records. Eddie Cochran records, Sibelius records. We did this gig in Paris in a festival outside where a gun club opened for you 2 And the promoter's kids... These children were 9, 10, 12, I suppose, um, and they were a band and they played a version of Sex Beat. They played a version of Sex Beat in French. And they were really cool little kids. They were all decked out in punk rock gear and, you know, creepers and leopard skin and little mohawks. And they were, like, just fucking adorable, you know? And you saw them and you were like, you guys play Sex Beat, you guys have to play for us. We asked the promoters if these kids could play Sex Beat before we did. Of course not. No. They cannot. So naturally, we had to have them up there. So what we did is we had them stand around nearby, behind the fence. I think there was a small fence. And right before we played, we pulled them up on stage, gave them our equipment, and said, go. And they started playing Sex Beat. But they only knew, they only knew this one song, and they didn't even know how to end it. So they just kept repeating verse after verse after verse. And then they go back to the top and go. So they probably ran through the song like four or five times. And like they, they went, they played it for about twenty minutes, like really, truly twenty minutes. And you two, especially Bono, was just livid, man. He was just like, "What are these fucking kids doing?" So me and Duckworth and Patricia had to actually go out and physically carry these kids off the stage because they didn't know how to actually end their song. We were all really trashed anyway, so we we were making the promoter give us each a case of beer, and we were just tossing the cans back into like U2's equipment because of course we had to like set up in front of U2 it was like because they were the they were U2 and um but I remember then finally when they, they played they had to spend another 20 minutes taking out all these cans out of their bass drum which was right behind me so I kept throwing my my cans into their bass drum so they came out and went boom bam, and it was like <laughs> all these cans rattling so I had to stop again I always felt that Jeffrey was very poor at drinking. He would have two or three drinks and then he'd cry. I remember being with him in New Orleans, he expressed an interest in scoring some heroin. So I hooked up with a musician friend and I can remember sitting in a car, having to explain to Jeffrey what Dilaudid was. Well, the New Orleans musician looked on in disgust. Of course, you know, we were wicked little fucks in our early 20s. 
our tour manager had this farm and on a couple of days off we went to this farm to chill out except we had nothing there but drugs and booze there was like no food and jimmy the tour manager goes hey barney check out this gun here's, here's jeffrey nobody expected me to really start shooting over jeffrey's head but jeffrey's like in the in the in the field and you could see like you know it's like cornfields you can see jeffrey's head ducking down and like running through the field going hey what the fuck you doing stop ah! i was like jeffrey you motherfucker this is the last time you're gonna pull this shit <laughs> you know and he's like you didn't fuck with me too much more <laughs> you never ever again I can remember torturing Jeffrey by doing versions of his lyrics. I remember D and I did Texas Serenade as Yogi Bear and Boo Boo. And I can just remember him telling stop! He would do stuff like want to arm wrestle me and things like that. And like, you know, it would be pretty queer after a while. It's like, Jeffrey, come on now, I know I can beat you tonight! Like, Jeff, you know, it's like... Before in the morning, we'd all be toast. And be like, hey, D, let's arm wrestle. Like Jeffrey, you know. But he would do, he would do strange shit like that in the middle of the night. D was really the kind of person that Jeffrey wanted to portray himself as being. D really had used junk at length. D really could drink a lot. D really did fight. Jeffrey was never good at all these things. You know, we shared a lot of things, and and I thought that was genuine and not just for whatever reasons, or, you know, I want, I'm gonna be with Dee because he's cool for 10 minutes right now, or whatever, but I, I generally, like, we did stuff together that was, we talked about a lot of shit, and, you know, books, and art, and whatever, and I think we thought of each other as close friends, but Jeffrey was a really bad business person. You know, he was the gun club, he owned the gun club, he, you know, called the shots or didn't call the shots or, and he had management and between it all, they figured out all the, all the money from the last tours and there was nothing left to pay anybody else, I don't think, except for like dirt, you know, chump change. That's the way the bands are, you know, it's like, you know, there's always the money fuck-ups. The money fucks up everything, generally. Money fucked it up, but, you know, worse than money fucking it up was some sort of conserv... Yeah, I guess it's money fucking it up. It was like a conservatism that, you know, or like a chicken shit, you know, uh, safety mechanism of the people that wanted to make money and thought they knew, you know, where the, you know, how to slay the golden goose and do it, that they were just going to ignore, like, a whole generation of rock and musicians, you know, like they had the nerve to think that like the music that comes off, you know, just off the street and out of the, you know, out of the garages and all this shit, you know, isn't some sort of natural uppouring of, of you know, the nation's music. I feel an affinity for anybody in any band anywhere, you know, because we're all in the same boat against the sheds, you know. So, you know, I, I, I always felt that music was like the Mafia, you know, we're all in the thing together, you know, we're going to fight the outside world. I think Jeffrey's entire thing was a commercial impediment. I mean, he was intellectually too intense. The music was too indie for mainstream acceptance. And that voice was like kind of that wounded caterwaul, which is not pleasing to the, you know, brain damaged uh, mediocre masses who lap up FM fodder, you know, perpetrated by Clear Channel and their cronies. In fact, a lot of the great bands in LA couldn't even make albums. Like the Alley Cats and different great bands. People never saw the Alley Cats when we got to get that down and, you know, make an album immediately. They didn't even get to make an album until 79 or 80. And they'd, they'd been rocking the house for a few years at that point. All the LA, all the London bands had all been signed and gone. He was going to be at the Mercy Distribution anyway. And, and advertising, you know. And bands don't have that money, you know. Just as you're starting out, you have to get signed. Unfortunately, when you get signed, usually they sit on you and they don't promote you, you know. Or they try and change you, which has always been a puzzle to me. Like, why sign a band and then try and change them completely from what you signed? I never understood that, you know. It's like a guy gets married and the chick changes him, you know. So no other chicks will fancy him anymore, you know. You, know, you see this kind of shambling screw-up. I go, what, what can he do? I mean, you, you don't even want to give him a car. You, you know, you're like, uh-uh. 
I need to do my laundry. We'll do it for you. I mean, he'll never even figure out a washing machine. Not because he's stupid. Just he's one of those people like, him have a straight job, it could never work. He could never work in that world. It's like you could never have Iggy be a waiter. He wasn't an accountant, and he wasn't that savvy, like, you know, like, this is a business in my band. You know, it wasn't like that. Don't, don't give him a real job. They can't balance a checkbook. They can't do anything, but they can do that thing. Jeff was one of those guys. I think Jeffrey decided he didn't want to be around D anymore. I think he was intimidated by D and just failed to call him back to come play some more shows. If I wanted to be Jeffrey's friend, it was better that I wasn't in the band with him. And I wanted to stay his friend and be friends with him. And that meant, you know, Jeff, me doing what I needed to do. So, I mean, Jeffrey it was Jeffrey's band and I wasn't looking for a democratic thing by any means, but um, it, was, it was pretty chaotic, so. We played some shows in Los Angeles without D. That would have been with Terry Graham back on drums, and Terry Graham is an excellent drummer. He really gave the band a lift in a way that you could really feel on stage, in a way very few drummers could. We played a few shows in Los Angeles, and we were going to play in Australia, but neither Terry nor I could get any information on how much we were to get paid for this. We met Jeffrey at the airport in San Francisco with Patricia. Jeffrey was being uh, an enormous asshole that night and uh, basically told us, well, you know, if you want to be in the band, there's the gate, there's the uh, doorway into the plane, get on the plane and I'll see you in Australia. And we, Jim and I, just kind of looked at each other like, um, get on that plane with a surly guy who we really just don't like anymore and um, fly for 16, 18 hours for a handful of shows. We have no idea if we'll make any money from. So we basically um, said, you know what? Uh, we're going to go rent a car and we're going to drive back to Los Angeles. We really thought that we were getting dicked around. And I think finally they said, well, you can save your per diem. You'll have something that way. That's the daily operating expenses uh, for eating and what have you. Patricia was very brave. She, she, we told her what we were going to do. Uh, but she went ahead and got on the plane and went over there with him. I respect her for that. Uh, I thought it was very brave. Uh, but Jim and I just, uh, we, we uh, got the fuck out of Dodge. And there's this big tour booked and, you know, everyone was freaking out. So, uh, so Jeffrey, like, you know, a day or two after getting there, gave me a call and said, like, can you come to Australia, like, now? And I was like, well... Yeah, of course. <laughs> you ask, I shall come. And also, I was like really off my, you know, the cramps was definitely off the books by then. And um, so we went and did an Australian tour with me, Patricia, Jeff, and, um, and two Australian pickup guys. So we did this crazy tour. It was pretty ramshackle and makeshift, but a lot of fun. I think we were taking a lot of drugs, but it was at a at, you know at a time when drugs were kind of still working in our favor and still hadn't imploded on us at the time. You know, there was still. I think we weren't full on. You know, we weren't full on drug addicts. We were you know weekenders or whatever. And so we, you know, made some crazy alcohol and drug-filled celebrations. And people, I think, had fun and loved it. You know, Australians are such yabos anyway. And <laughs> they dug it and understood us. So uh, we came back from this Australian tour and um, somehow Terry was back in the band. <laughs> or whatever reason, just because there was, you know, because it was the best thing we had going. So, uh, Jeffrey had already written songs by then, like some of the Las Vegas Story songs, and um, we were still on Animal Records on Chris Stein's label, which Miami had been on in the Death Party EP. And um, so we started recording in Los Angeles at Ocean Way Studios, 
And I think Chris had gotten ill at this time. So someone at Chrysalis was overseeing the project. And so I think maybe they suggested uh, this guy, Jeff Eyrick, who ended up producing the record. The Las Vegas story was certainly, production-wise, uh, kind of like a more legit um, album. It, it was uh, not produced by a, a, a friend, you know, even though uh, Chris D and, um, and Chris Stein did a great job with the, the time and money uh, provided to them it was uh, it was their first really um, you know someone put a lot of TLC and money into that production you can certainly hear it the one thing about the gun club and us and like you know we have very excessive behavior you know especially Jeffrey and myself and um, and the thing is we always really were able to pull it together for recording was always a serious uh, Thing to us, Las Vegas story was great because it was uh, it was bringing everyone back together. Everyone from Los Angeles, um, you got Kid back playing with Jeff, which was a great thing because that was the initial forming of the Gun Club. And Kid and Jeff worked really well together. And um, you had uh, Patricia on bass and Terry on drums, two original bags. And so seeing all those people back together again was a very good thing. There it is, Las Vegas, and the inspiration for Las Vegas story, part of the inspiration. Actually, Vegas has always been uh, an inspirational place for a gun club. Uh, we're always making pilgrimages here, always thinking about it, the trashy side of it, the mob run Vegas. Basically, the Vegas that doesn't exist anymore, but, uh, you know, it's one of those things, if it, um, it definitely inspired us. Uh, no matter what, and uh, if it inspired us, uh, uh, you can bet it inspired the uh, Las Vegas story. This is like the only place you can find old Vegas, but it's so fucking ratted out that, um, you know, you can't come down here and you, these places, they look decent on the outside, but it's basically uh, one giant crack boulevard, and in a sense, the underbelly of America. I mean, that was always Jeff's thing. Jeffrey's escape was blues and, um, you know, burrows and a lot of the dark, seedier things, whether it's drugs or, or, or just who he chose to, like, hang out with, whether, you know, girls. You know, like, Pukowski says, you gotta, you gotta be on the lowest rung or something, and, and he, he dug that. He, he, wrote, he wrote about being down and out. One of the, the cool things I liked about Las Vegas story, besides the fact that it was, uh, you know, it just it just had a great sound, great producer. But I mean, like Dave Alvin played on that, laid down some really good tracks. And by this time, Jeffrey was really into his lead guitar thing. I mean, he was he was playing guitar full time by now. After the Australia thing, yeah, Jeffrey said that you know he had been working with Jim Duckworth, who was such a virtuoso and like really amazing a guitar player who could play everything. And it was really great, and we really realized that our, my style and his style really complemented each other. And I think that's part telepathic because we've been playing, we have played together for so long, and I learned guitar from him. Jeffrey Lee's guitar chops with all the touring had gotten, you know, pretty good. He played like Jeffrey Lee Pierce, you know, and the band, the guitar sound of the band was was there, all the little parts and nuances of their, of, you know, it was noisy, but it made sense, you know, and it was all kind of loosely worked out, and and then he called me up and asked if I wanted to play lead guitar on a couple things, and I thought, I don't know where, what I would do, but I went down to the studio, and I think I was playing Fender Mustang, and yeah, or maybe I was playing, I might have, there may have been a guitar just laying around there, it might have been that kind of thing. Ry Cooter was doing actually the Paris, Texas soundtrack at the time in the same studio, so there was like really some of his cool stuff there. So we kind of, we actually didn't, we, we really didn't use it all. No, but, uh, <laughs> but we picked up a thing or two. And just, yeah, plugged into a Marshall and just, 
made a racket, you know, and and we did it a couple of times, and that was it. That's the thing I think with that with that Las Vegas story is just it's a it's a good record, but it's a little bit uneven. It's a different record. It was very much born out of the uh, Brian Geisen cut up theory, and uh, that like I said, this was a time when we were influenced like a lot by free jazz and literature and like a lot of beat literature especially. Jeffrey was a huge romantic as was in a really insane way I don't know if people agree with us but Burroughs it's an incredible um, vision of of another door into a, of, of a whole other world right in front of your own nose and that appeals to Jeffrey in a super powerful way. Jeffrey he, um was very, 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 you know, taken with, with William Burroughs and, you know, has had met William Burroughs and, you know, done some readings with them and they, they went to his house when we played in Lawrence, Kansas. Are you guys trying to make me work? The Las Vegas story tour, yeah, was like, I think we went through America back and forth a few times, I think. And then we went to Europe and it seemed to go on and on and on. And I really loved the Gun Club then. I mean, I was really proud of the band. I think that there was a real magic happening in those live shows for the, at least the beginning of that tour. Blue Sky Trucks. There was a lot of drugs, a lot of drinking, a lot of, uh, you know, it was just kind of a very, very insane, insane way to live. And um, Jeffrey could be very insufferable at times. And I think that's when he had his trumpet or saxophone or something. And the door flies open, and here comes Jeffrey, man, and he's got like a, a he's got these cases, like these beat up, you know, leather cases. And he goes, Hey, man, I just went to the pawn shop, man, and I bought this stuff, man. Which one do you want, man? Do you want the trumpet or do you want the saxophone? For me personally, the horn, um, I, I wasn't afraid of the horn. We just started honking away on these things, and Jeffrey just immediately starts going, nah, you know, and uh, we're making this, like, horrible noise in this bar. The bartender is just, like, shaking his head. I just wanted to hide the horn. I remember him coming, with, you know, coming out with a trumpet one show. And he had just gotten it that day, and he just played, you know, this just ridiculous shit. <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm, you know, Roland Kirk. Well, you're, you're not Jeffrey, but I'll give you a lot of points for, you know, believing in yourself. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck is that? It's a bunch of noise. I just wanted to get the horn and throw it out the fucking bus window. He wanted to do a jazz gig. So they put it in the LA Weekly, you know, Peter Case and Jeffrey Lee Paris, you know, their jazz gig, and for some reason, like both, you know, because of both of the bands being involved, the place just packs out with people. But we only knew two songs. We did Love Supreme and we did So What. I think to Jeff, music was not a static thing. The gig was just a, a complete disaster. It was a kind of flowing river, and uh, you splashed in it, you played in it. We cleared out the club with our horns, man, because, like, that was a way of, like, you know, well, you can't say we sold out, can you? You know what I mean? You can't say, you know, anything about it. We cleared the joint out with a bunch of noise, you know? It was always a kind of moving, flowing thing. That's a way of, like, ma maintaining your freedom as an artist. <laughs> Be holding the no audience, right? If you blow them out of the club, they can't, the one thing they can't say about you is, you know, you're kissing their ass. I play backwards trumpet. That was something Jeffrey did throughout his career. As soon as people started liking him for something, he would do something to kind of jam it back in their face. So the next thing you know, we were doing John Coltrane's A Love Supreme, or A Burrito Supreme, as we often refer to it. Um, and he would go on stage with this beat-up dented trumpet and just blow it and, and squawk and, and make a bunch of noises. And it was, again, he was just kind of blowing that trumpet right up the ass of uh, everybody that liked Gun Club. He would do all sorts of things to... Uh 
uh, you know, sort of piss off audiences. We wanted to piss people off and we wanted to make people think and we wanted to um, just create an atmosphere of some kind of nihilism. <laughs> Jeffrey was going for that kind of, you know, gee, is Morrison going to take his penis out on stage kind of vibe? You know, Jeffrey Lee was going for, geez, God, I hope to God Jeffrey Lee doesn't take his penis out on stage, you know? It was always chaos and it was always swirling. It was always present and it was, uh, <clears throat> the goal was to be a troublemaker. I guess there was a pretty good sized crowd at this club, but they weren't digging what Jeffrey was doing. And it finally, at some point, he just turned around to the audience and said, Hey, wait, well, you know what? Fuck Texas. And I guess the entire place en masse attacked the stage <laughs> and caused a minor riot. If you can say one thing about Jeffrey Lee Pierce, you could say that he was fearless. He was fearless in his, uh, in his dedication to art. And, and, I mean, even though he wasn't a fighter, he would, you know... He'd call somebody a pussy and then run, <laughs> you know. So that's good. That's a good thing. People don't uh, people don't do often enough. It really fueled him to piss people off, you know. And, and the more that uh, I think, the better the the more the crowd disliked it. Sometimes the more he enjoyed it, you know, and the farther he would take it. I mean, I just took it as it went, but I was investing time. Uh, in this in this thing, and so I wanted to get something back, you know, if not a career, um, at least a, a legitimate musical statement that would allow us to um, live off of it, so we could continue to create. And um, after a, a two-month uh, European tour, which was going pretty well actually, I asked the road manager in Paris how much money would be remaining at the end because I mean, you know, thousands of fans were showing up at every show. He said none. Uh, and um, a week before that, I had 15 hours of live videotape I'd, I, I had taken of uh, every show and interviews, etc. That had been stolen in Manchester, England. So I, I had real trouble kind of figuring out uh, how I was going to keep doing this. And then um, Jeff and the rest of the band told me, you know, they're going to stay in London, actually. They're not moving back to the U.S. It's now a London band. And so... I didn't have a document of the tour. I wasn't going to get paid for it. And there was effectively not going to be a version of that band in the United States any longer. So um, I got my passport along with my friend Amy, uh, who was there with me on the tour. And uh, she and I uh, snuck out of the hotel at 6 o'clock one morning. Uh, we had to wait, unfortunately, 18 hours to catch a train to Calais in, uh, in France. Um, but we did, uh, got the train, got to Calais, got on a hovercraft, went to Dover, England, uh, got on another train, went to London, waited a day, got on a plane, flew to New York, got our car, which was in storage in Queens, drove that car all the way back to Los Angeles and escaped gun club uh, forever. Terry fit really great and knew the stuff and teaching another drummer and going through the whole process of getting someone up to that level of, of intuition is a big drag. And uh, having this great tour and then having all this stuff turned to shit, you know, it's exhausting. Especially when you're on drugs and drunk the whole time. And I think we were feeling like we couldn't create something new or better at that point, you know. and. Why, why continue? And uh, so, you know, we parted ways there, you know. I think Jeff just grew weary of the whole gun club tag. And uh, again, the gun club, with the exception of East Coast and some European countries, is a very obscure band. And to do all this trailblazing and to have very little in return for it, it must have been very frustrating. And to have not only one lineup, but two lineups, just, no, three, to completely dissolve in front of your eyes must have been very frustrating. And to have to deal with all these different personalities, it's like this little family. And to have three families leave you, I'm sure you must have just been really tired and 
you know, it must have been really dreary. So he decided to do his own thing um, with Wild Weed. Actually, Jeffrey asked me to play on that record, but I thought, I, I think you should make a record that doesn't have me on it, you know. So we all landed in London and like kind of did things, and that's when he met up with uh, Nick Sanderson and Rami Mori and his band, the Jeffrey Lee Quartet, the live band for the record. And, um, and Rami had become his girlfriend, and they started living together and being a couple. I do remember him being hooked up with Rami and, and that being sort of pleasant. And, and he seemed very solid with that relationship. He finally had a home and her roommates and her friends and his friends. I visited Jeff in London and I was really uh, pleasantly surprised to see how relaxed he was. You know, he really had picked a life, a woman that was making him happy. So, like one day, I was talking to Jeffrey, and he suggested that we make a gun club again with Romy and Nick. I think he was uh, uh, not really into the doing the, the solo thing, and um, maybe the popularity wasn't as much. And uh, and he just thought it was maybe time to ask. To, maybe you know, I think with him and Romy, they decided it'd be a good idea. And, and so I, I suggested that the band, instead of like being in London, like get out of London and, uh, and record in Berlin. Mother Juno is just such a great record. To go from something that was genre-breaking but pretty straightforward to some surreal masterpiece, like the breaking hands and hearts, you know, the chord progressions might be simple, but there's just these nuances on this record. A lot of the songs for... Uh Mother Juno album were very influenced by our childhood in LA. You know, there's like like Lupita screams. You know, just like using Mexican imagery and um, sound. You know, kind of a hard rock sound. Kind of uh, yellow eyes, definitely. Jeffrey said he just like had an idea that this was a kind of a, a song that you would hear coming out of a garage in El Monte, <laughs> you know. Around 86, 87, when his band put out the Mother Juno album, I was touring a lot in Europe with the Rollins band and we would play together on festival dates and stuff. And uh, Jeffrey was combating, you know, his, his chemical abuses and he got clean. Right around the time of Mother Juno, he got all lean and the album was good. The tour's going great. You know, he, it's, it's, he's doing really well. That band was, it shocked people, especially like the British press, who really had really gotten down on Jeffrey, you know, because you can be their favorite. And then when you go out of favor with them, you know, you're really out of favor. And they would say some, like a few journalists would say some pretty insulting things, you know, like, you know, personally insulting things. And, um, you know, I w and that really made people, that band and those shows really made people like go like, oh my God, you know, not only is he, you know, not fat Jeffrey anymore. He's stronger than ever. And there was a real um, fierceness to the band uh, in those days. And Jeffrey really, uh, although in not great health, he was super strong on stage, you know, and the band was super strong and that music was super tough music. And um, so the first couple tours, you know, definitely for that album were really great, you know, on stage. Um, and uh, it was just like a bit later when things went back to not so good. Jeffrey's, you know, uh, abuse of alcohol and drugs, and his, his actually failing health started to get the better of him, and then obviously reflected in the shows, you know. And maybe that's like 
was part of the beginning of the end for me because I think maybe my heart had gone out of wanting to to, to do the gun club in general. The shows um, were starting to get really more patchy and uh, things kept just going on and we made that pastoral hide and seek record the divinity record yeah after the divinity ep kid congo powers left from that from that period and it was kind of a dire time for jeff it was not like a a dramatic uh oh my god i'm quitting because i can't stand this it was more like i think the whole thing was fading into some weird area jeff was coming up with the lucky jim material which was kind of which was Jeff always had this running thing of somewhat morose records, but this one was especially dire. A house is not a home kind of sums up that time. I know his health was, was failing at that time, and he was in and out of hospitals, um, a lot of drug rehabs at that time. And um, I know his relationship was with Rami was fairly rocky. That was falling apart, and... Uh... I knew he was upset about it, but I didn't actually hear a lot about it from him. I think she eventually left with the drummer, which is some, you know, pretty hard to take if you're the singer and the drummer gets your chick. I mean, that's some spinal tap stuff. He felt really betrayed because it was Nick and Rami that, you know, got together. But I also understood Rami's uh, reason for leaving him. She had taken so much care of him and she couldn't do it anymore. You know, and he was getting really crazy. But he had physically lost himself, which I think made him lose his mind. As I think nothing was processing itself right. And didn't he go back to Japan? Jeff got really into to J Japanese culture and, and Japan in general. He talks about it in his book a lot. He visited um, uh, Japan all the time. He would keep himself inspired. I think that was part of the romance with Romy and part of his romance with Japan and, and, and Vietnam and that, that, uh, that Far Eastern thing, because he, you know, he had that element of adventurer in him and, and did promote that mythology. And uh, I thought, you know, it's brave to do that stuff. I, wouldn't, I didn't go to Vietnam, go, you know, hitchhiking around or taking trains or whatever he did. Guys like that, if they go to Southeast Asia, they're not going really, you know, they're not going to look at ancient ruins at Angkor Wat, you know. Uh, they're going for drugs, so I wasn't... It was like, oh, great. Yeah, after that, I, I guess he came back to L.A. and was very fucked up. <laughs> so that's when they made Lucky Jim. So it was, for one, economically not sound, and plus I was... I told Jeffrey already I didn't want to do any more. His health was failing pretty bad, um, but you gotta hand it to Jeff Pierce, you know. This guy was doing very poor and, and health-wise and mentally he was shot, but even his last work was fantastic. And you can hear how sounds like Jeff's really on his last leg, and he, he truly was. So we went down to the hospital, Keith Morris and I, in Santa Monica, and we um, tried to talk Jeffrey into, you know, going to a rehab and, uh, if you get sober, then we can get you a liver or something like that. And he just really wouldn't have any part of it, you know. He was, uh, there was a moment of clarity that he kind of, well, and then uh, <clears throat> the self-destructive Jeffrey mind took over, and uh, and he uh, he said, I know more than the doctors do. They've been telling me I'm going to die for years. I've been studying my disease. They don't even know my disease. Well, you know. So. I know he was hanging out a lot at, like, Viper Room and... There's like just lots of stories about this, and he was, and uh, so I didn't actually see him a lot until I think um, until uh, I guess Mike Mart and some people told him, you know, suggested he make a do a gun club show or two or whatever, and that they make a band, and he asked me to play and. Um, and I was, and he sounded good enough to me. <laughs> it was uh, it was billed as a gun club, and it was Jeffrey and 
and I and Kid and uh, then we really you know blew it out and it was it was good you know playing the songs and then we got asked to do this other show remember that was not so good Jeffrey looked really bad like his face was really swollen like almost looking like frog eyes you know he was so bloated like from whatever his illness by the time that they that they did their last show at the ringling sisters benefit it, he i knew he was gonna die very soon then i mean he looked so horrible jeffrey went to uh his father's to go dry out for one you know and his father was actually really helping him with that and being really cool about that and he was writing the book the Go Tell the Mountain for Henry. We worked on like a lyric section, a pro section, because he had all this stuff going on, and he's showing us all this new stuff he'd been writing. And he was reading me from the book. He was reading me like all the stuff about Isaac Hayes and talking to rappers or spies on the Tokyo Tower and all this crazy stuff. And we were like really laughing like so much about it. He thought it was hysterically funny. And we would spread all the lyrics all over the floor, little bits of writing on half pieces of paper. And this, this place would look like, you know, some, it, all this had been washed up on the floor, you know. And we would piece the book together, little by little. And then Jeffrey died. No matter how much you're ready for it, you're never ready for it, you know. And it was just really, you know, uh, you know, it was like so devastating, you know. He probably didn't, like a lot of people, was not didn't allow himself to appreciate what he had accomplished. And that was, that's a, a sad thing in the artist mentality in general, and it definitely applies to Jeffrey. Where, uh, oh, no, nothing became popular with quotes around it, so therefore, I'm shit. But <laughs> it actually starts with, I'm shit. So, so therefore, no matter what happens to it, I'm still shit, you know. That's that's a that's a bad place, and we're all uh, <clears throat> we're all guilty of that. He was so he had to be so aggressive to take his to make his thing work that in a lot of you know in the town that that it caused him a lot of grief, you know, and I think it made him it, it hurt him, you know. It's more mysterious and interesting now that he's gone. Get, put it this way: this is kind of a weird thing to say, but guys like him. Music like that is usually done by people who are dead. You know, people that do stuff like Jeffrey, they're talented despite the shit they do to, to, to kill themselves, you know? They're not talented because of it. They're talented despite it. He had a huge talent. He might have thought he was stealing all this stuff. I'll tell you, man, he was, you know, he was doing a lot of things that were completely original in ways that, like, other people, you know, wish they could have been doing them. Not many people can say that they invented something. Very few. Now that he's gone, he's, he is totally legendary now. He is lore at this point. Just because of all the imagery of the songs, you know, the great romantic aspect of his playing and that, that voice. What a, a lonely, beautiful sound his voice was. It was like, you know, something calling from a bayou somewhere. Really something else. Jeff is definitely a touchstone for a lot of creative people. Um, I. Uh... I miss the guy incredibly. I'm conflicted because, you know, I, I hit this guy in the face with a golf club so many times in my mind. At the same time, if I didn't know him, I wouldn't be the cool guy that I am now. I saw Jeff in a nightclub. I was just visiting Los Angeles and I see him there. And I had been told, you know, he looks bad. He's, he's, he's gained a lot of weight. He's lost a lot of weight. He's just, you know, uh, on his last leg. and. And, so, and I'm looking at him before he noticed me, and I'm thinking, God, he, he, he looks good. He looks like he always has. I mean, he, he really didn't look any worse for wear. And so I just walked up to him, and I just stuck my hand out, and I said, How you doing, Jeff? And he stuck his hand out, and we shook hands, and it was just like, I don't know, all that rancor, all that animosity just disappeared in, in one second. It, it, like it never existed. And, and I just thought, it's just, it just seemed like a, a Hollywood thing to me. And then what does he do? He reaches into his wallet, pulls out a business card, and it just says, show business. And it's got his phone number on it. And I thought, perfect. 
Perfect. <laughs> Listen, uh, what is it? What's going on with you, Terry? You're writing a book. You wrote a book. Yeah, I'm. I'm uh, actually just kind of putting the uh, finishing touches on it. It really is, as corny as it sounds, a celebration of everything that we did at that yeah. time, and uh, it, it'll it'll be happy. It'll it'll be sad. There's nothing corny about it, and you've already sold the copy too. One for me, one for Chuck. Oh, great. One for oh sure. good. I thought I'd, I'd have, have to give you a free one. No, no, <laughs> no, absolutely not. And uh, yeah, Ward, how about you? What are you doing? Um. I just, uh, yeah, I have a band called the Liquor Giants that, you know, plays occasionally, and but, you know, not really pursuing the uh, lucrative and uh, glamorous rock and roll lifestyle these days. Ward and Terry, it seems a shame because you've made some of the greatest punk rock and roll the world has ever heard, and I want to thank you for coming to the Mighty Morning Show. This is uh, Indy1031. My name's Dickie Barron. Thanks, fellas. Hey, thank you. Thank you. I had no idea. What... How about the uh, self destruction that's so often uh, associated with rock and that whole. No. <laughs> Case in point. Not self destroyed. 58 at Christmas Eve. Still going strong. And what, what about those who don't make it? What are you? Too bad. Thank you.